We got up about 11 hours before uh, launch, got to relax a little bit, and then suited up about midnight, went out to the launch pad, uh, got on board the orbiter about three hours before launch. In a minute, you'll see a picture of me, uh, I think, resting, <laughs> and then saying, uh, waving goodbye to the closeout crew. As, as they left, uh, we prepared for the final countdown. Well, night launches are truly spectacular, and maybe I'm a bit biased um, since both my launches have been at four in the morning. Uh, but when the booster's light, uh, two things you know for sure. It gets really bright outside, and you know you're leaving the planet. Uh, <laughs> The next shot you're going to see is looking out the orbiter overhead window, and it should give you a cockpit perspective of the roll program. Here, if you look closely, you can see pad 39A, and then the, the coastline go by. And from the pilot seat, um, you really feel the roll program a lot more than you perceive it visually. You're pretty busy looking at instruments and especially the main engines. Now, everybody knows the ride during first stage is a little bit rough. There's a lot of vibration. You get about two, a little more than two Gs laterally. But uh, the tension breaks a little bit when the uh, boosters finally come off and the second stage ride is really smooth. Uh, you only have about a minute or so of the 300 pound gorilla sitting on your chest. And then everyone is uh, pretty much all smiles when zero G arrives. Here you can see the payload bay doors opening after we've gotten to orbit. In the very uh, far background, you can see the space hab double module where we had a lot of our logistics to transfer to Mir. And in the foreground, you can see the docking system and those three metal pedals that are sticking up are on a ring that will extend and will actually capture Mir, and you'll see that coming up in the uh, rendezvous sequence. Jeff, you want to say anything about the uh, orbiter docking system? Well, you just saw the ring extended with the pedals, and Mir comes down with a uh, similar set of pedals that mate to that and latch to that ring, and then we withdraw the ring into towards the, the orbiter and mate the two systems together. Of course, that was a shot of the uh, orbiter approaching Mir, taken by the uh, Mir crew members. The, uh, the rendezvous was really incredible. Seeing uh, Mir, uh, such a huge spacecraft out there, uh, was really an incredible sight. It was very exciting. Uh, everybody was very busy. Uh, Brent and John were on the, the forward part of the flight deck uh, taking care of all of our rendezvous tools that enable us to make a nice smooth docking. Uh, inside of 30 feet, you can see us here. Things got very uh, quiet as we monitored our uh, range rate. You can see the jets firing in the background as we approach. We were approaching at about 0.1 feet per second. Uh, in a minute, you'll see the centerline camera, which is our main aid that we use to, uh, to make sure that our alignment is just right. And uh, in a minute, you'll see the moment of docking and capture. There it is. And as it approaches again from the outside, we're about one foot to go. Still see some jet firings. And then as we uh, contacted, you can see a few oscillations that were damped out in about three seconds. This is the view from the inside the cockpit. You can see a little bit of bouncing around as we contacted, which I think was mainly due to the thruster firings. And of course, we were all very happy that the uh, docking was successful. The mirror was really quite beautiful, changed uh, colors in different lighting. This is in the... Uh Docking module, and of course, uh, if you've been on the mirror for uh, a while, when an American space shuttle pulls up and uh, docks, it's, uh, I'll call it quite an emotional moment, because you know it's your ride home. They were banging on the hatch and saying, come on, open it up. <laughs> <laughs> the space shuttle is a beautiful uh, spaceship, and I had picked it up about uh, eight minutes before uh, docking, and it was very beautiful. This is uh, Brent coming in, uh, Sasha, <coughs> having a big hug. <laughs> it was a very uh, emotional time. And once we got through the uh, initial hellos, we went on into the mirror through uh, 
crystal, that's the node that you see, and in into the base block, where we set up the cameras and got ready for our official uh, welcome ceremony, which was, uh, it was really just a lot of fun. Meanwhile, back in the hab, we started with the uh, transfer procedure. Now, everything that was nice and, and tidy were these white bags that were in those gold bags that were in all the walls and, and the racks on the side. Um, we take gravity for granted in most everything we do, and when the time comes to take a 60-pound bag in a bag and take it out of that bag, um, things got a little bit tough. You see, I'm wearing work gloves there. And then the bags went with all the crew back into the mirror. Of course, as Marcia said, all of the bags that were in the hab had to go over to Mir, and it's kind of a long way. And I'm just showing you here in a tour, that's Jeff uh, leading the way through <coughs> the various tunnels that get you over to Mir. And so we're going in, into the tunnel adapter, and in just a minute you'll see a change of orientation. And there are lots of changes of orientation as you go from one spaceship to another. Straightforward there is the hab. Now we're turning the corner up into the orbiter docking system that uh, meets with the, the mirror docking system on the way to Crystal. And you can see Jeff doing a little bit of porpoising around. You can see bags of water that we're temporarily stowing uh, in the docking adapter. And now we're going into the Crystal module. And there really is no up or down. It may look as if we're going sideways to you, or some of you may think you're going up, some of you down. Uh, once you're in microgravity and floating, it's all the same. And all, all the up or down is created by your brain. In Mir, there are some cues. Uh, there's a, a bungee cord that helps to orient you to, to translate through the various modules. In this case, we're going through Crystal. In some places, it gets kind of tight. Those are air ducts that carry fresh air to and from various parts of Mir. And all along the walls are, are stowage areas. The Mir has been up there for a long time, over a decade. And you never want to throw something away, because you never know when you might need it. And we're still in Crystal. We haven't even gotten to the central node yet. We're still just going the way that we went many, many times with all of the bags with the transfer items that we had. And Jeff is just about to the node in that picture. They just haven't had someone like me up there to clean is why it's got all that stuff. <laughs> meanwhile, <laughs> meanwhile, back in the hab, we're still pulling bags out of bags. Um, we came up with a plan that said we took all of the bags in the hab and took them to the mirror, and then we picked up all the bags that were in another module in the mirror and brought them all back and, and put them away. And it, Looked a little bit chaotic, and it was for a while, keeping track of all the bags. <coughs> Meanwhile, while more bags are coming out, uh, we continue the tour. We're in the, the central node now. And this is the way to Perota, which is where we took all of those bags. The, the cosmonauts and John had a great plan where uh, they had emptied out the Perota module. So all of the things we brought up went straight into this module. And you can see that gyrodyne uh, that you saw in the earlier picture. And as soon as we get another change of orientation, to the left is actually the floor. And you can see that there are many, many bags stacked up. And this is where we brought everything. And so John and Valeria and Sasha uh, are probably still sorting through all those bags and, and finding all the stuff they need. But it was a great plan and well organized. So another picture of Mir from an aft payload bay camera view. You can see the Soyuz on the top and uh, the Spectrum module off to the right and the Gavant 2 off to the left. And here, uh, John is uh, back in BioRack now doing uh, one of our biotechnologies experiments. This particular one, called Isozyme, looks at an enzyme that um, has an effect on the immune system of humans and white blood cells. And it's looking at the effect of microgravity at different uh, levels of microgravity and uh, how it affects the activation of that enzyme. So here we're all together saying uh, goodbye. Actually, this was a fake goodbye, but we, we did it but to be representative of one. And uh, so everybody's hugging everybody and uh, telling everybody their final goodbye. <laughs> Again, an emotional time. Everybody uh, you know, was trying to make sure that we had everything that belonged on the orbiter side on that side and everything that belonged on Mir uh, on that side. Uh, Jerry, of course, had kind of gotten used to his surroundings by now. And John and Jerry spent a lot of time talking, uh, trying to get Jerry up to speed and make sure that he knew where everything was that he needed. And we finally said our final goodbyes and closed the hatch the night before we undocked.
Well, Jeff uh, is the person who actually initiated the undocking uh, with a push button on the docking system control panel. And after the hooks opened up, there were two springs, which uh, exerted about 700 pounds of force. And those springs did the initial separation of the two spacecraft. As soon as the pedals were clear, uh, Mike was at the uh, aft control station, and he uh, fired a few jets to initiate the uh, separation or increase the rate of separation to about 0.3 feet per second. And from that point on, uh, the separation out to 400 feet was pretty much hands off for the crew. Uh, we took that time to uh, take some pictures, of course. And uh, this is a picture taken, obviously, from the mirror side. And then Mike and I uh, had a chance to switch places, and I jumped back to the aft station to get ready for the, the fly around. You know, after the hatches closed, I don't think there was anybody who was looking forward to the fly around and the undocking and fly around more than I was, but maybe John Blaha was looking forward to it a little bit more than me. Um, you know, for him, it was a chance. It was one step closer to being home and with his family. Now, once the separation got out to 450 feet, things got really busy on the aft flight deck. And of course, Marsha was in the center of, of it all, just where she likes to be. And in her right hand is a, a handheld laser, and in her left hand is a Nikon with a 400 millimeter lens. And she's doing a pretty good juggling act uh, with the two pieces of equipment. Uh, Jeff was also shooting pictures with the Hasselblad, and you'll see John pop up there. He was uh, laying down on the floor. <laughs> he was actually laying on the floor, and he had a pretty good view, I guess, from, from down there. Uh, as Brent alluded to earlier, one of the main reasons for the fly around was to be able to photograph uh, the mirror from all sides. Uh, one of the things we want to use these photographs for is to look for damage that occurs in long-term spacecraft from residual atomic oxygen up at those altitudes that can have a corrosive effect, as well as micrometeorites. And that will help us uh, design space station better for you know, long-term long uh, viability and maintainability. And so uh, we'll feed all these pictures back to the space station study groups that are looking at uh, the material aspects of long duration spaceflight. Of course, Mir was, was really beautiful to look at. Uh, this is uh, sunset on Mir. And as it goes tonight, you know, the Earth is also very beautiful to look at. And when you fly over cities at night when it's clear, they, they stand out and are very bright. You can see lots of detail going down is, at the bottom is the Earth limb. You can see thunderstorms from the, the lightning. There's a view of uh, Japan and Tokyo Bay and the city of Tokyo, which as you can see is very large. Everyone should recognize that. That's New York City, Long Island. Going up the East Coast, you can see Providence coming into view. And uh, just before this scene leaves, we'll see Boston coming in on the upper left. We had a lot of great views of, of planet Earth uh, as we were flying around the planet. This is a, a shot of my favorite place, California. It's where I'm from. We're coasting in over northern California. You can see the, the Central Valley. And on the right side, the Sierra Nevada is starting to come in. You see a lake at the very top, which is the Pyramid Lake. Uh, and you'll start to see another lake uh, in the middle of the Sierras there. The dark spot is Lake Tahoe. Uh, we'll pick up another lake, Walker Lake in Nevada, coming in from the right. And then the right center is Mono Lake just to the east of uh, Yosemite National Park in the, in the Sierra Nevada Mountains. Just a, an, a great pass over uh, California. This was towards the end of the mission. This is a shot of Florida coming down from Tampa St. Pete looking to the east. You can see that Florida is completely clear uh, and the clouds are just kind of hugging the coastline on the east coast. Going by Lake Okeechobee in the center, coming up to the center now and at the very bottom the the Keys, the Florida Keys. Well, right after the undocking, uh, we rebuilt Tevis. Here you can see Marsh and I working on putting the boxes together on the vibration isolation system. And Brent is in the background working on the power IFM to uh, get some uh, power to Tevis. And here we're putting it in its frame, getting ready to run. And uh, the initial results look very promising with less than a pound of force going into the surrounding structure. And John will tell you how it was to run on it. I had the opportunity to run on it, and uh, I had been running on treadmills on Mir for about four months, and this felt very normal for me, and I had a good 40-minute uh, workout there on the treadmill. And the rest of us exercised in other fashions. <laughs> we, are, we are trained professionals. Do not try this at home. <laughs> and just in case you wonder what it looks like from our point of view. Well, 
Well, eventually it's time to come home and uh, we get everybody suited up on the flight deck. Here you can see Brent in the foreground putting on his helmet and uh, Bakes in the background. Um, shortly after we do our burn to slow us down so that we start falling towards the Earth, we hit the Earth's atmosphere and, and the friction causes this plasma around the, the vehicle and you can see some of those flashes coming in through the overhead windows and through the commander's window on the far side there. Our ground track took us in over uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, basically down across Nebraska and the central U.S. This is somewhere around 80,000 feet in Mach 2.7 or so. Uh, and this is the first really time that we could pick up the horizon. Uh, I guess it was sunrise on the ground probably in the central U.S. Uh, and we, like I said earlier, we landed about 9.20 in uh, KSC. This is when the HUD is turned on and you can see the HUD symbology. Those are the two, uh, are the sonic booms when we uh, decelerated below Mach 1. And here we are intercepting the uh, heading alignment circle and coming around Merritt Island. You can see there Banana River. Uh, like I said earlier, the uh, orbiter is just a fantastic flying machine. It handles very nicely uh, and the weather was just perfect. Everything, all the conditions were great. Uh, to help us out with the landing. For those of you that aren't familiar with HUDs, uh, you've been looking at the HUD symbology. Uh, through a, it was taken with a camera mounted uh, in the pilot's HUD. Uh, Marsha did a great job, I think, getting that on our flight, and it really adds to uh, debriefing for us. You see on the right is the uh, orbit processing facilities and the vertical assembly building. We're approaching at 300 knots and about 20 degree glide path angle. At 2,000 feet, you'll see us uh, start our pre-flare pull-up to arrive on the uh, on our final flare, and hopefully around 30 feet above the threshold as we cross the runway and for a touchdown at 195 knots. Gives you an idea of how fast we're actually going there, decelerating from 300 knots to 195 knots in the pre-flare. The gear comes down at 300 knots. And we see approaching, and on the left you can see some lights we call the ball, ball bar, which are landing aids for us, help us cross the threshold at the proper height. We're at 20 feet now, 220 knots, and a nice view from the, from the rear. Followed by the drag chute, and then uh, lowering the nose to the runway, and then we uh, Braked, started breaking about 80 knots, got rid of the chute at about 60 knots, and came to a stop uh, about 2,500 feet from the other end of the runway, which ended our mission, I guess, 10 days and almost just under uh, five hours, I guess.